All right. All right. So um, we're going to um, we're going to be talking about energy some more today and talk about how um, phase changes um, and and how we can use how we can treat some some various types of energies um, that we can calculate or that we can measure um, as conversions. It turns out for a lot of a lot of things like phase changes or chemical reactions there's an energy associated with those changes, but it's in the form of a combined unit, similar to um, similar to a speed or a density. And so we can actually use that as a conversion. Um, and so this was, this was on the uh, homework from last week um, as sort of a, a reach um, for you guys to sort of see if you could make that connection. Um, and it sort of walked you through it a little bit, but we'll get some more practice with that today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, different types of phase changes. And then we'll get into talking about types of matter. And uh, if we have time, we'll get into atomic theory. Um, and atomic theory is, is just the idea that I mentioned before um, that um, there is a, a finite size that beyond which you cannot split things in half without changing what they are. So it's the idea that atoms exist is atomic theory. Uh, and we'll talk about how that came about and, um, and what the implications are. Um, couple random fun questions. I don't know if we'll get to all of these today. Um, but since, since I was at a, con at a Zoom webinar thing about uh, alternative energies just last week, um, I thought that the first question was very was very uh, relevant, at least to things I've been thinking about. Um, and it's also relevant because, um, at least if you're asking me, it's relevant because I actually worked on uh, photovoltaic materials when I was in grad school and trying to develop better solar solar panels. Um, and so that that actually comes into what are the what are the challenges that solar energy faces? If we're trying to use solar energy to make electricity, which is generally what we're trying to do, there's actually a built-in maximum efficiency that you can reach. Remember, I mentioned all of those all of those joules of energy that we're hitting um, hitting the Earth every second from the sun. Um, I think the problem is we can't turn all of those into useful electricity, uh, at least not in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and so what? we basically have a, have a maximum efficiency of about 32%. Solar panels in general are limited by the, by the spectrum of our sun and the nature of how semiconductors work. Um, you cannot get better than 32% efficiency um, with a regular semiconductor. Now there are things you can do to, that are, that are uh, engineering issues um, to try and make this to basically put two semiconductors on top of each other in a way that um, you can get slightly better efficiencies. You can get up near close to 50% um, with, they, with these devices, they call multi-junction multi devices, but the engineering challenges are way trickier. Um, and basically you have to have these devices set up in a series in a way so that the current generated from your first device is the same as the current generated from your second device, which is non is not a um, easy problem to solve. Um, so you see it, but but these these devices that get above thirty two percent efficiency are really really expensive. Um, so they would not be used in in the context of like generating electricity here on Earth. They mainly get used for applications like NASA or designing satellites. Because when you really, if you're sending a probe out to Jupiter where the solar radiation is much, much lower, we have a lot less solar energy, makes it all the way out to Jupiter compared to Earth. You want to make use of every photon you can that hits your, your probe's uh, solar panels. So in those applications, these really, really super expensive solar panels that can get above 50% efficiency wind up being useful. Um, but on Earth, that's not really feasible. Um, and so there, the, one of the biggest challenges with solar is the fact that we're always going to be capped at about 30%. Um, and plus that the production of solar panels themselves is actually a very nasty process. 
Um, they're able to use a lot of the silicon that is not up to the, the standards for making processors can be used to make solar panels. But still, it's the process itself is very, very um, ecologically unfriendly. There are a lot of hazardous chemicals and hazardous waste that's produced when you make solar panels. Um, so on one hand, it's, you know, it's carbon neutral. We're generating electricity and current without generating any, any uh, atmospheric carbon. Um, but on the other hand, where we have other costs, so ecological costs associated with it. So it's um, definitely a challenge. And one of the things that's, that is um, slowing down the adoption of solar panels. Um, but then, and then the other thing that's just worth bringing up um, is the fact that there is no, what we call a silver bullet um, approach to alternative energy, to, to carbon neutral, sustainable energy sources. You can't just pick one source. Basically, fossil fuels are so energy dense and we've been using them for so long um, that you, to try and replace that is going to require more than one alternative energy source. So solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal energy, nuclear energy, uh, hydroelectric dams are all pieces of the puzzle that are all going to be needed. You're going to need to use all of them in different amounts, depending on where you are on the globe and, and what resources you have access to uh, in order to make up the difference of the energy that's produced currently by fossil fuels. Um, and Brooke, thank you for reminding me. You do not see those slides posted on Canvas because I have not posted them yet. So while I'm talking about random things, I will also be um, doing that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about gene therapy next time. Um, I'll jump down to the bottom and talk real quick about um, CO2 in the atmosphere and, and the, the uh, cost associated with um, ocean acidification, which so is, is another ecological problem that's perhaps um, just as dangerous, but not talked about as much um, as uh, global warming and the greenhouse gases, is the fact that if you have more CO2 in the air, um, you are also going to wind up with, by just by the way things work, you're going to wind up with more CO2 dissolved in the oceans. Um, and if you have CO2 dissolved in the oceans, let me just finish this real quick and then I can focus on what I'm saying. Uh, if you have CO2 dissolved in the oceans, it actually interacts with the water itself um, to, there we go. All right, you should be able to see the slides now. Um, it interacts with the water itself to make carbonic acid, which is the same thing that happens when you carbonate water in a drink. Carbonated water doesn't taste like regular water anymore, right? It's actually more acidic because when you dissolve CO2 in water to carbonate it, you make it more acidic by making this carbonic acid as a byproduct that happens that you can't really stop that process from happening. Um, and so that's one of the things that's happening as a result of climate change is as we have more CO2 in the air, we wind up with the oceans becoming more acidic as well, which can cause a lot of problems because um, a lot of, of microorganisms in particular are very, very specifically adapted to certain pHs in seawater. If you change that pH very much at all, you wind up with things like coral not being able to, to photosynthesize um, or even, even reproduce at all. And so you wind up with you know, broad swaths of, of coral reefs basically becoming bleached and dying. Um, and that's not because of any one action, that's just a result of the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so there's a lot of issues with ocean acidification, and that's that's all tied to um, the issue of increased carbon dioxide in the air. Um, so it's it's just as as pressing of an issue as the temperature rising and sea levels rising is the fact that we also have these um, these the ocean acidification happening as well, and then. One last one for today. Um, how did the very first chemist test experiments without ending in fatalities? I thought that was a good question. 
Um, and the broad answer is, well, they didn't always. Sometimes people died. Um, uh, not very often because tip, typically these early chemists and alchemists um, figured out pretty quickly how to, um, you know, what was going to be a safe or dangerous reaction pretty, pretty early on and started figuring out how to, you know, use just even just open air um, windows as a way and or use a fan to make sure that any fumes were being blown out the window as opposed to um, them breathing it being breathed in. Um, but sometimes chemists um, make mistakes and occasionally they wind up hurting themselves. Um, and uh, one case in particular that was only in the last couple, I want to say in the last decade, um, there was a researcher from Cornell, I believe it was, one of the Ivy Leagues in the Northeast, um, who was doing research with uh, methylated mercury. Um, which mercury is not particularly good for you, but when it's methylated or when it's organo, um, bonded to organic materials, carbon-based materials, it's even more dangerous. Um, and this, this researcher got, got basically a drop so small she didn't even notice it um, above her glove, above the, the rim of her glove, right on her wrist. Um, and it was that was enough that it wound up killing her about a week later. Um, so it's, you know, working in a lab is inherently dangerous to some extent. You can minimize that if you know what you're doing and you're using proper safety protocols. But there is always some danger inherent um, to being in a lab, especially when you're working with really, I would call that an exotic material, but really dangerous materials. Um, and then there was a question about carbonated beverages. Usually when you drink a carbonated beverage, you don't actually increase the CO2 in your bloodstream very much because when you, uh, most of the CO2 actually just winds up being released to the atmosphere in the form of bubbles. Um, and that happens af even after you drink it, right? You burp um, when you drink carbonated beverages. And so most of the CO2 is not actually gonna be um, making its way into, into the bloodstream in any way. So it'd be unlikely that drinking a lot of carbonated beverages um, would be likely to change the, the carbon dioxide concentration in your bloodstream. It might give you ulcers though, or might cause some damage to your teeth because you're drinking an acidic drink a lot. So just like drinking lemon water is bad for the enamel of your teeth or could give you an ulcer. Drinking enough carbonated beverages in theory could give you an ulcer as well just by acidifying your stomach um, contents. What do they call it? The, is it called the chyme? What chyme? I can't remember. What do they call the, the mixture of after you've swallowed everything? If you acidify that enough, then you can wind up irritating your stomach lining and causing issues. All right, these questions are more relevant to, to the topics um, and I, and most of you asked these, um, there were duplicates of most of these questions, so we'll go over them. Um, can there be a negative Q? Absolutely. Negative Q just means it's something lost to energy. Positive Q means something absorbed energy and the temperature increased. But if your temperature decreases, then that, mean, that just means that whatever went down in temperature gave energy to something else. And so we use positives and negatives in the context of energy. Positives and negatives user, usually refer to something gains energy if it's a positive Q, or something loses energy if it's a negative Q. And we'll talk about that in the context of phase change in a second um, to give you a better idea of how that, how that works. Um, does the specific heat of elements differ depending on humidity? Um, I've actually never been asked this question before. This is a great question. Uh, and the answer is yes, to some extent. Um, as you increase humidity in the air, you have more water in the air all of a sudden. And water has a higher specific heat than dry air does. So it actually gets harder to change the temperature of anything that has lots of water around. Um, one of the reasons why we have such huge fluctuations up here in Tahoe as far as um, you know, going from 60 degrees on Friday to inches of snow yesterday um, and, and it being cold enough on the ground for that to accumulate. One of the reasons that that can happen at Tahoe 
is because we have such low humidity, both in the air and in the soil. Um, and low humidity means it's e easier to change the temperature of the system. Um, so places like, like Minnesota, where you have tons of water all over the place, Minnesota, it might snow in, in September, but it's not going to stick till the ground freezes to the point where the lakes start freezing over. Once all that water in the ground is frozen, then you can have snow start to stick. But up here, we don't have that nearly as much moisture, despite living next to a lake, we still have a lot less moisture, which means we wind up with um, it being a lot easier to change the temperature of the ground in our air because we have less moisture. Um, several of you asked how the heck did they figure out what a joule is and how they could measure things in joules anyway. Um, basically, somebody at some point realized um, that different substances changed temperature faster. Um, and you guys actually have seen this before. If you've ever um, gone down to, to the, the uh, valley in California where it, on a 100 degree day, um, if you've ever picked up a penny that's been sitting out in the sun and you notice it burns your hand really quickly, but you could leave a bowl of water out in the sun till it got to the same temperature, but the water is not going to burn your hand the same way that picking up a penny does. And so that has to do with the fact that the, the penny can give away its energy faster than the water does because the penny has a lower specific heat. And so it came down, this Q equation originally came from people just realizing different substances at the same temperature would give off different amounts of energy because you, you could burn yourself on some things, but not on others. Um, and so, so, you know, qualitative um, realizations like that are what led to a lot of these, equ these equations. It's just somebody notices, huh, that's weird. These things are the same temperature, but this one burns me when I touch it and that one doesn't. Um, and that all comes down to specific heat. And that's what they started testing is, okay, well, how much energy is released? And they, they had various ways of measuring how much energy were, was released. And most of it came down to how much did it change the temperature of a water bath? Um, so it's this Q equation is all tied to um, specific heat, partly because of that, those original observations by these early scientists. Um, somebody asked about, are you missing out doing things online, taking chemistry online um, rather than in person? Um, real labs are fun, but they're also very tedious. Um, and yes, there you're missing out on some skills by not being in lab, but you're actually getting, um, there are some things that these virtual labs actually do better. Um, for instance, this week's lab is, has to do with adding protons and neutrons into a nucleus and seeing what that does to various properties. You can't actually do that in lab because you can't pick up a proton and add it to a nucleus. We can do that if we do that on a computer. Um, so there are some things that are actually better online. Um, recording lectures uh, and being able to go back and rewatch the lectures for help. That's something that wouldn't have been possible more than a year ago, um, just because I wasn't in the habit of recording my lectures. So you do get some benefits. Um, that said, it is kind of sad that we miss out on the community and forcing you guys to spend three hours a week with each other uh, in person and playing around in labs. Um, but next, year for those of you taking the gen chem series we will be fully back in person starting in the fall so uh, and the lab skills from this class are not really lab skills that uh, um, are all that helpful to your everyday life um, if you're going into a field where you need lab skills you're going to be taking more labs anyway and you'll be all the relevant skills you'll pick up when you go to those other classes um, and I just noticed the comment about altitude. We'll talk about altitude and phase change in a few minutes when we get into talking about phase change. So if I don't answer your question, Gina, bring it up again um, when we get there. For now, um, I, the, and the other thing I just wanted to mention was that um, if you have a zero on quizzes, on a quiz, because you didn't do it before I graded it, you can still, I will still go back and give you credit for that if you go back and finish that quiz later. 
Um, just because it was due yesterday doesn't mean you can't finish it now. It's open till the end of the quarter. Um, so finish the quizzes, um, even, even if they're late, uh, and you'll still get at least partial credit for them. Um, and then I also wanted to mention a lot of you noticed that there was a different way of entering the numbers for this quiz, and that was hard because it wouldn't let you put units with it. Um, this is that was me playing with the um, auto grader on Canvas, trying to get it to grade you, give you guys grades properly. It doesn't like units though. So I think I'm going to go back to the original way of you guys have to put it in by hand and include your unit. Um, and it, I just have to go back through and, and grade them all by hand anyway. So um, I, if you were struggling with the number format that didn't uh, count against you um, on any of the quiz questions so don't don't stress about it and I will try to be consistent from here on out and um, now that I think I have a handle for what works and what doesn't all right let's talk about homework problems so there was there was one tricky one in there right there are several that were a little bit tricky there's one in particular that was tricky. Um, so problem one, problem two, I think you guys, I don't didn't get much in the way of questions about problems one and two. And I, so I think that you guys had a handle on the, the easy problems when it comes to this Q equation, right? Um, some of the Q equation problems got a little bit trickier, and that's what we started seeing in number three. Um, so for number three, and, and a lot of times, and this is just good to know when it comes to um, how I write these homework questions, and just in general, when you see a multi-part question um, in a science class, frequently you're going to have to use your answer from part A to answer part B. So breaking it up into a multi-step problem is usually trying to walk you through the process in one form or another. Um, so for A, the, or for 3A and 3B, what I was really trying to help you realize is that if you know how much energy is absorbed by the water, you can figure out the specific heat of the metal by, because you can say however many joules of energy went into the water, had to come from, um, had to come from the uh, piece of metal, right? When you think about it logically, if you've got a bowl of water at room temperature, and you've got a hot piece of metal. If you put the hot metal into the cool water, what happens? The metal gets cooler and the water gets warmer, right? And so, the metal cooling down is what warms up the water. And so what we're saying here, the big jump from 3A to 3B was realizing that the Q that went into the water was the same as the Q that came out of the metal. So once you realize that, then 3B is really just the same as 2. Right? If you know what the energy is that came out of the metal, you can plug that in for Q. If you know what the mass of the metal is and you know what delta T for the metal is, you can get a specific heat. And let me pull up the key on this. Alan, what uh, what in particular, what's the first one where you're seeing a different number sig figs than me on the key? So almost all mine, like for, for number one, uh, I have, uh, Four sig figs. Um, I'm I'm pretty I'm off on pretty much every one of them by just one sig fig, and I'm not sure what number you're using to count, like or what number you're using to get your sig figs. Uh, yeah. I um so part of it it could be just as as simple as when you when we always say the way I phrase it when I'm going quickly is you keep the same number of sig figs. Right, but it's not you're keeping this, you're not keeping the same number of sig figs as your your number with the most sig figs. You keep the same number of sig figs as your least number of sig figs. So for this first one, you've got four sig figs on your mass, four sig figs on your specific heat, but only three sig figs on your delta T, which means your answer should only have three sig figs. Right. So 
remember when we're doing when we're doing our rounding, you're going to the fewest number of sig figs for these. Um, and that's the most common place to to mix these up. And again, if you I'm not grading the homework on did you get the right answers? And so if you do want to double check why your answers are different than the key, um, this is a perfect time to ask that question so that we can we can talk about it. Two is the same thing. You've got three sig figs on the on the energy. You've got five sig figs. Sorry, you've got four sig figs on the energy. So like, I think I got two right, but I, I messed up three A, three B, four B. So like I have three sig figs. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. This, and this is a good, okay, a, sure. another good one to pay attention to um, for, for all of you. Delta T means you've got to do that subtraction before you round, right? So even though both of our temperatures have three sig figs, the difference in temperature is only two sig figs. Thank which you. means you only get two sig figs on your answer. Um, and so for, for 3A and 3B, once you if you know you're dealing with water and you know you've got mass of water and you know you've got a delta T of water, then we just plug it into our Q equation. And then for B, this was the key step here, right? Q for the metal, is equal to negative Q for water, right? And what I mean by that is that the energy that went into the water is the same number, but with the opposite sign as the metal, right? Because if it went into the water, it came out of the metal. So whatever number of water gained, the metal lost. And that's why there's that negative sign there and why you wound up with a Q that was negative. And then once you know what Q was, you can solve for specific heat of the metal because our delta T is also going to be negative, right? If our metal is cooling down, if it's starting at 90 Celsius and going to 25, delta T is negative for the metal because its temperature is dropping. So if you've got a negative on your Q and you've got a negative for your delta T, those negatives will cancel out and you'll get a positive specific heat. Right. And that's a good one to pay attention to. Usually with these with these energies, especially um, a lot of times the the sign on the energy is just a way of keeping track of is that is the energy absorbed or is the energy being released? So if the metal is losing energy, the energy is being released because the energy, the metal is going down in energy. Um, we wind up with both of those negatives. And it also means that you could have wound up with a negative specific heat if you missed a negative sign somewhere, right? And a negative specific heat doesn't make any sense. If you think about, about what specific heat is. Specific heat is the energy to raise one gram, one degree Celsius, right? So if you have a negative specific heat, that means when you put energy into the system, the temperature goes down, which is not very intuitive or logical, right? If you put energy into something, the energy, the temperature should go up. We're not talking about things like refrigerators at this point or laser cooling, which are two cases where you can put energy in to lower the temperature of a system. So all we're talking about is putting a hot object next to a cool object. So if you dump energy into a system, the temperature should go up. Therefore, all of our specific heats should be positive. So if you got a negative specific heat, that just means that you missed a negative sign on one of these two numbers over here. Not that big of a deal. You just need to re recognize it and re realize before you draw a box around your answer that you shouldn't have a negative sign on it. Um, Four is getting into what we're going to talk about in more detail. So I'm going to go through four, and then we're going to talk about it again in a second to really solidify it in your head. Um, the question for four was, if, you, if water condenses on your glass, does it cool the drink down or does it warm the drink up? 
And this is kind of a tricky concept, but we can apply the same idea from number three, that if, if you have water in the form of a gas that's floating around in the atmosphere in the form of, of humidity, is when it goes from being a gas to being a liquid, that's dropping in energy. That even at the same temperature, then the water molecules are losing energy to go from a gas at room temperature to a liquid at room temperature because they're not able to be moving around as freely. And so when, when you go from a high energy state to a low energy state, that is going to be a process where the water is going to lose energy when it does that. And if the water loses energy, that energy has to go somewhere else. So when water condenses on your glass, the water is going from gas to liquid. So the water is losing energy, which means your drink is gaining energy. Um, and 4B actually has you calculate things. Six grams is not all that much water. If you've ever taken a really cold drink out of a fridge in uh, the Midwest or in the South in the summer, um, six grams of water is not very much. You wind up with water condensing on the outside of that cold drink very, very quickly, right? Um, and so you can actually calculate that by using this number that's given to you, the heat of condensation of water. And the key is really to look at the units here. The heat of condensation of water is 2.26 kilojoules per gram. So all you really need to do to answer 4B was, was realize, oh, well, for every one gram of water, that's 2.26 kilojoules of energy. And if I have six grams of water, I can just cancel grams with grams and wind up with Um, a conversion, basically. Not basically, it is a conversion. The same way as we can use density to calculate um, to calculate or convert grams to a volume, we can say, okay, well, if I have 6.5 grams of water, and for every one gram of water condensing is 2.2 kilojoules, released. All right, and so I added grams of water and kilojoules released just to give ourselves some context for what these units mean. But this is all you had to do to, to get a Q for 4B. If I've got 6.5 grams and every one gram is 2.2 kilojoules, Grams of water cancels grams of water, and we're in kilojoules of energy released. And so once you know what Q is, now we can plug it in and find delta T. Right? Once you get Q, it looks a lot like the problems from 3 and, and, and uh, 1. So this, again, throws me off, but I think you had three sig figs on here. Yes, I just can't see my screen at the same time um, that I have. Uh, so but it would there only be two. So it would be no, 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 no. I just was going from memory, and I knew it was two point two something. Oh, okay. So two point two. This should be two point two six, and this should be six point five one two. I think yeah. So we would okay. wind up okay. keeping okay. three okay. three sig figs in this case. So there's your, that'll give you your answer for 4B. That's how much energy was transferred. That The process of condensing the water is going to release 2.26 kilojoules. So then C was just plugging it into our Q equation. Plug the answer you get here into our Q equation and solve for delta T. All right, which... I'm going to switch back to sharing screen. So you would get 1.47 times 10 to the 4 joules. Um, and this one did not give you a mass of the soda. 
Um, so you can, anytime you think you need a number, um, you either can, can look it up or make an assumption. For instance, if you didn't have access to the internet, you might just say, well, I don't know what the mass of a soda is, but I know it's about 12 ounces and you could get an idea for how much, what the mass of that is. Or you can even just ballpark it. I think it's about a quarter of a pound, um, which is not all that close of an answer, but it still would be something that you could plug in and get an answer here. Um, and that might mean your final temperature would be different if you used a different number for your mass. Um, but that's fine, as long as you, you make a note of any assumptions like that that you're making. I don't know what the mass of a soda is, so I'm going to look it up. And then you say mass equals this. Um, and when you wind up, if you wind up uh, doing these um, conversions for the temperature conversion, you wind up seeing that six grams of, or six milliliters of water condensing on the outside of your cold, nice cold beverage um, can raise the temperature to 50 degrees pretty quickly, um, which is why in the Midwest and the South, people wear, use beer koozies for their beverages in the summer. Um, it's not because the beer koozie insulates it from the heat on the outside, it's to prevent condensation from happening on the outside of your can. So using a beer koozie when you're going to, if you have a cold canned beverage in the water defeats the purpose because you still are going to have lots of contact with the, with the water and you're going to wind up with your drink warming up anyway. Um, but it definitely does help as far as keeping your, um, not getting condensation on the outside of your drink. See, chemistry is useful. It can tell you how to keep your beer cold longer. Um, the trickiest one on here, so those three and three and four each had a, a little bit of a trick that you that you may not have gotten to on your own. Five is the trickiest mathematically because we can't actually solve for delta T or any of these numbers separately. So we actually have to do a substitution. And it's going to come from the same same assumption that we made right here, where we said Q metal is equal to negative Q for the water. The difference is for part five, instead of getting a number for Q, you actually have to plug in Q for the metal, CP for metal, delta T for metal, and mass of water, CP of water, delta T for water. And so you wind up with a much more complicated looking, mathematically, it's not any more complicated. Um, but we wind up with not being able to start simplifying numbers and, and canceling things out until after we wind up with a big, um, two big equations that we have to set equal to each other, right? So we can write Q for water is mass of water, specific heat of water, T final minus T initial of water. And we can do the exact same thing for the copper. Q for copper is equal to the mass of the copper times CP of copper times T final minus T initial of copper. Just a reminder, this, this looks really intimidating because when you start replacing numbers with letters in math, that, that makes people nervous, and I get that. Um, but all of these subscripts are, are just to as a way to keep track of what mass I'm talking about. Is it mass of water or mass of, of copper? Right, so if you could do one, you can do this one as well. Once we have these two equations written, the trick is saying, well, we can take one of them and set it equal to the other. We have all of these numbers except for TF. TF is the only one of these numbers we don't have from the problem. So, we can say Q for the water equals negative Q for copper, just like in 3B. And then we wind up 
with this expression, mass of water times specific heat of water times T final minus T initial of water equals negative mass of copper, specific heat of copper, T final minus T initial of copper. And now again, T final is the only thing we don't have. So at this point, you just need to plug in the right numbers and then condense everything. Right, so and then we would wind up with after we plugged in all of our numbers for mass of water, specific heat of water, initial temperature of water. And then we have mass of copper, specific heat of copper, initial temperature of copper. This just turns into algebra at this point and arithmetic. How do I distribute these? and get all of your TF variables on one side and get your numbers on the other side. So mathematically, um, I guess not mathematically, the, the term we use in math and science for this is once you get to this point, they call this plug and chug. Once you get your algebra equation set up, you plug your numbers in and it's just a matter of remembering how to foil things and how to distribute things and how to move things from one side to the other. All right, and I, if you go through that whole process to solve for TF, um, then you wind up with a, a TF of 23.0 Celsius. All right, so without, sorry, Gina, your cat looks just like my cat. Um, that was really confusing to me. I think I know where my cat is though. Um, so, but once we get to a point where we're just plugging in the numbers, plug and chug, might take practice. It's easy to mess up your algebra someplace. But if you do your algebra properly, you will get a number that makes sense. And in this context, you might, you know, we have a, a fairly reasonable situation here. Five grams of copper is not much more than a penny. So if you take a penny out of, that's the same temperature as boiling water and you add it to, 100 grams of water, that shouldn't change the temperature very much, right? From on a conceptual level, our temperature of the water should go up, but not by very much. You're not going to bring um, room temperature water up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit by adding two pennies that are hot to it, right? So this is a trickier one to do your reasonableness check, but if you think about the physical system, it does kind of make sense. Dana, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. I was just confused with this problem because I didn't know if there was an equation for this problem or if this is just something that I should be able to solve for by reading the problem. Um, this is about as tricky as it gets. So this is one that, that's sort of pushing the boundaries of what I would not expect you to answer this on a timed situation on okay. the, the time test. This is a really good question for something like the take home test where you've got a whole week to work on problems. And okay. where you can work where you can work together and even the take home stuff I'm probably not going to give you anything that's way far away from anything you've done before the take home test is probably going to be variations of the trickier word problems that we've seen. So if you keep your notes, if you can can recognize some of the similarities, the take home problems are certainly doable. Um, but I would not expect you to be able to do this in a in a timed situation um, for this class. For for Gen Chem, maybe is one of the uh, wild card problems, but even then, it would not be like a. Um, if, if you're feeling confused as you're trying to tackle that, this one, that's normal for this problem, right? We'll get you to where you've seen a lot more of these tricks pretty soon. Okay, and one more thing. So if I'm yeah. missing two, um, let's say units um, in the equation that I'm trying to solve for, is it safe to say that I'm gonna have to do something like this? Cause I know I didn't have the final temperature and I know I didn't have um what else was i missing the specific heat or the mass it was the mass right i think you had any everything except for tf for this one for both um, okay 
yeah, I think you had everything except for TF. You had initial temperature, you had mass, you had specific heat for this one. Um, okay. so, so this one, the trickiest thing was realizing that you could set the two equations equal to each other and combine your equations that way. Could I have um, solved them separately though? Not really, because if you don't, if you, if you don't know what TF is, then you yeah. can't get Q. Oh, so we didn't have Q. We didn't have Q. Okay. Um, and yes, so yeah, you you were correct. We we were missing Q and we were missing TF. Okay, but we got don't, it. We don't need Q if we can set these two things equal to each other. Yeah. All right. Thank you. No problem. Um, and this this also, uh, Katie, that's that's totally reasonable when you see a, a word problem that's got a ton of numbers in the problem statement. Um, the way that that always worked. Not always. Um, I I blanked on tests when I was a student as well, um, and on homework assignments. What generally served me the best was to start um, writing down what those different numbers were. Look at the units. It says, oh, okay, it says I've got 5.69 grams of copper metal. Write down M sub copper equals 5.69. You start pulling them out and writing them as variables. Because as soon as you start realizing, oh, there's, this is a temperature change problem. If it's a temperature change problem and you've got mass and specific heat, your first thought should be, oh, I'm, this is gonna be a Q problem. I need to use that Q equation somehow because I've got most of the pieces of it. So part of it is just being able to look at the units and get some familiarity with the units so that you can start to see um, you know, what type of problem it's going to be, what equations from our equation sheet might you might need to use. Um, and part of it is is practice and and um, you'll start to see patterns, just like in algebra, once you've seen a trick like foil, um, then you start, then you can use foil, right? First outside, inside, last for multiplying things together. Um, if you've never seen that before, I wouldn't expect you to be able to come up with it on your own. Um, so we will keep practicing with problems like this and you guys will get more and more confident. Um, and like I always say, you might not feel like you're getting more confident with it, um, but by the end of this quarter, you'll look at some of the, the, they say the aluminum foil problem from last week. By the end of this quarter, you're gonna look at that and say, man, I struggled with that. That one, I totally get that. You're still gonna feel lost on some of the trickier ones, but what you consider tricky is going to get harder and harder. All right, so we'll, we'll keep getting you guys there. Um, let's look at the algebra here. I'll do that on the board. Um, so I'll stop screen sharing here. All right. So Given my limited space, I'm gonna simplify the two sides of this first and then combine them again. So for the left-hand side of the equation, you've got 100.0 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times TF minus 22.6. All right, so if I'm gonna simplify this, um, the first thing you might wanna look at is, is the units. Um, any units you can cancel out are gonna make this go, um, go faster. And frankly, when we're doing a bunch of algebra to simplify these things, as long as you make sure that all your units are, are matching with each other, like all of your masses are in grams and all of your delta C all of your temperatures are in Celsius and all your uh, energies are in joules, we can leave off writing the units for the sake of, of doing the algebra, um, which will make things take up a lot less space at the very least. Um, so first off, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna multiply these two together. So you have 100 times 4.184. So we'll get 4.184 um and then that's going to be times tf minus 22.6 
Now we just need to distribute this. Right, and so when we distribute this, we take 418.4 times TF and 418.4 times negative 22.6. And we'll get, this comes out to be 418.4 times TF minus 9.46 times 10 to the three. All right, so then if we do the same thing to the other side of the equation, multiply your mass and your specific heat and then distribute over the delta T, we would wind up with, I'm just gonna write my equal sign vertically. So I'm right the other side below here. I would wind up with 219 minus 2.20 TF. Right, and so that's that's multiplying the 5.69 times 0.386 times a negative sign to just combine all of those numbers together and then you distribute it, you get this. And I apologize in advance, I'm not a math teacher. I'm really not very good at, at uh, explaining math. Sometimes I'll do my best, but... Um, Will it uh, will stop me if I go too fast at any of the algebra steps? And I will. And I'll do my best to explain it. Um, so now, if we just, I'm just going to rewrite this for 18.4 TF minus 9.46 times 10 to the three equals 219 minus 2.20 TF. Now to, to solve this for TF, we want to get TF by itself. So we want all of our, everything that has TF on one side of the equation, everything without TF goes to the other side of the equation. So I'm going to add 9.46 times 10 to the three to both sides. And I'm going to add 2.20 TF to both sides. Uh, and when we do that, we'll wind up with get four four two zero point six TF equals nine four six zero plus two nineteen. Nine point six eight times ten to the three. Now that we've got TF by itself, we just need to divide both sides by the number in front of TF. So over four twenty point six over four twenty point six. We'll get a number for TF, which, unless I did my arithmetic wrong, should come out to 23. Yeah, 23.0. And then we can put our unit back on it. Since all of our temperatures were in Celsius before, we can assume that unless we mess up our algebra somewhere, we're gonna wind up with our temperature units still in Celsius. Because the units on our specific heat are gonna wind up canceling themselves out and the units on our mass are gonna cancel themselves on, out on both sides of the equation. So the only units that are gonna be left at the end are gonna be the degrees Celsius. And again, this is a class that a big P 
piece of this class is trying to learn how to use algebra tricks that we've learned in the past. And part of that means that knowing how to write your algebraic equations out and what you can say is equal to something else is a big part of that. That was the trickiest part here, other than just doing the algebra steps, was realizing that you can set those two Q equations equal to each other. Right, so we'll we'll do lots of, of practice with problems like this. Um, so we're just about at break time before we take a break. Anybody want have any questions on the um, homework that we haven't gone over that I didn't address yet? All right, well then I will, if you come up with questions over our break, feel free to ask them when we first come back. Um, but let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 2.35 and we will do some new material. Hey, Sean, um, I have to pick up my son from school during lab time or right before the lab or whatever. I wonder if it's kind of, it's is it a labster lab or? It's a labster lab. Um, I will be recording recording this one because depending on on how far we get in the lecture today, um, I might need to give a little bit of an introduction to get you guys started on it, but I'll record that and put it on on YouTube um, as we've done in the past and and I can catch you up pretty quickly, I think. Um, and Dana, yes, we okay. can go over problem two on the quiz. I'll uh, I'll pull that up um, over break and we'll we'll do that when we come back from from uh, break, okay?
All right, so there were um, a couple questions about the quiz real quick before we go move on to new stuff. Um, so question one, um, I think the only thing that was cons that people consistently missed was that I, I asked for kilojoules. And so I had a, a number of people put in put in joules. So you had if you put an answer that was 17,000, that was in joules, 17.3 kilojoules. Um, and then question two, I think the reason that um, that might have confused you is that I messed up the conversion on question two. The answer key had the answer in kilojoules. So if you put 173,000, you got it right. Um, I just messed up when I made the answer key on that one. Um, so in joules, you decided to convert pounds to grams. Uh, and then you wound up with, so pounds to grams, uh, there's 453 grams is one pound. So if you have 2.000 pounds and for every, for every one pound is 453.59 grams, the pounds wind up canceling out, you get 907 grams. Um, and to four sig fig, 907.2 grams. So 907.2 grams times 0 0.444 is the specific heat of iron, times delta T, which was negative 430. So when you plugged it in, got 173,000. That is the answer in joules. So if you plugged that in and got marked wrong, that's, I went back and I gave everybody full credit for, for that one. Other than um, if you put in all of those digits, then you had too many sig figs. You should only have three sig figs. Um, but I also recognize, and actually I think I probably have to go back and give some people credit for, um, because it didn't let you put your answer in in scientific notation, I think, right? Um, so I can I will go back and make sure that I give everybody credit for sig figs on that one. Um, but yes, if you didn't catch that you were supposed to convert to grams first, um, that's one of the reasons why we want to why you got to pay attention um, to the units there and also that typo there that G is not supposed to be there. I guess I'm going back and giving yeah, people that's credit what, across that's what the board for that one. G. Yeah, that's. I, did, I got bad. the answer to both of them. I did pounds and I did grams, but I was like, why is there a G there? Was it supposed to be grams or was it supposed to be? No, I, I didn't I didn't catch that. I went through and I graded graded all of these and I didn't catch that in the problem statement because I know what I wanted it to say. So um what do you mean? You guys can't read my mind yet? Um so I'll go back the and G make gave sure the that... cleaner answer. So I and I should have done the more complicated one. The pound gave a much more complicated answer. And I should have yeah, done the more complicated guy. So the, but the I, I went best... with the best answer for how it's written here um, would be with three sig figs. Um, and if, if we weren't limited by the auto grader, um, I would be looking for the answer that was 1.73 times 10 to the six, or sorry, times 10 to the five joules. Um, and if you misread that as grams instead of pounds, then um, then I think you get 383 or something like that, um, if I'm remembering correctly, based on that was the other really common answer that everybody got. Yeah. And, I and I'm pretty sure it had no decimal points. And that's why it was so beautiful. And I was like, oh. yeah, it ended nice and cleanly. Um, yeah, I'll go back and give uh, give all everybody uh, credit for that problem, um, because that's that's my fault on uh, writing that problem incorrectly. So thanks, Dana, for asking about that one. Um, did that answer your questions about it? Uh, kind of. I did it right. I actually just got, um, I made an arithmetic error, and I kind of knew that you meant grams. I just guessed that I should, but thank you. Yeah, no problem. And um, the, sorry, there was a question in the chat about positive versus negative for this one. Um, and positive and negative for energies, like I said, are basically a way of, of um, keeping track is, is energy being released or absorbed? 
Um, and so the other way of doing that is just by using the term released and absorbed. Instead of messing around with negatives, um, you can also just use, use the word released to mean that that's a negative cue for that system. Um, so it's because it's easy to drop a negative and wind up being totally confused about what's happening. I like using absorbed and released in these type of problems because that makes you think about is something getting warmer or colder. Um, and, and that in a lot of ways is more helpful than having a negative in front of it because in having a negative in front of it is just another place where you could drop a negative on accident when you're doing your algebra. Um, so I was not gonna be picky about the negative sign versus the positive sign on this one. If you put negative, I, I did not treat those answers any differently when it came to grading these. All right. And so let's talk about one of the reasons why released versus absorbed winds up being so helpful. Um, and so when, if we talk about changes in phase, between different um, between different states of matter. Anytime you have a different change in phase, meaning if you go from gas to liquid or gas to solid or solid to liquid, um, one, there's a different vocab term associated with those different um, phases. And here's sort of the cartoony version that has all the different versions. And most of these you've heard of before, melting and freezing. I, I, fairly confident you guys know the difference between melting and freezing um, and that you know a vaporization and condensation are a little bit more specialized. Most, most of you probably have heard those terms and understand um, what we're talking about. Vaporization is also, you can call it evaporation, is just as technically correct. Um, evaporation and vaporization mean the exact same thing. Um, and condensation is the opposite process. When gas goes to a liquid, it's condensing. Again, you guys probably have heard of those. This third case, when we have solid and gas um, converting back and forth, that's a little bit more specialized because the, the substance that we know um, that goes through phase changes most readily that we have the most everyday experience with is water. And water at atmospheric temperature or at, at room temperature and atmospheric pressure doesn't go through these sublimation deposition processes. So we have a lot of experience with melting and freezing. We have a lot of experience with evaporation and condensation. We don't have very much experience in everyday life with sublimation and deposition. Sublimation is, the, is basically a solid turning directly into a gas. So it's like a solid evaporating without going through a liquid state in between. Like dry ice? Like dry ice, exactly. Dry ice is one example. Um, and even in the, this example works better in the dead of winter. Um, but even if you've ever noticed that the ice on your driveway disappears over the course of a day, even if we never get above freezing. That's another example of sublimation. The ice on your driveway is turning into um, water vapor without going through a liquid state. It never melts. It's just turning, going straight from a solid to a gas. Um, and so that's, that's exactly what dry ice is doing. Dry ice is solid CO2. And when solid CO2 at atmospheric pressure, solid CO2 will turn directly into gas CO2. Um, and deposition is the opposite process. Under the right conditions, you can get a gas turned directly into a solid without going through uh, a liquid state. And so that, Example for that one would be like um, frost forming. Frost forming, it looks different. If you've ever seen dew that's formed as a liquid that then freezes, that looks very different than if you have frost forming, right? If you have water being um, condensing on your car overnight and then it gets cold and freezes, you have like a sheet of ice on your car. You get an ice storm basically. But if you have, if the temperature drops and you have lots of water in the, um, in the gas phase, 
especially at our altitude, at our pressure, it's a lot easier sometimes for gas, the gaseous water turn directly into solid water, turn into ice crystals without going through that liquid state. And that's deposition. Freezer burn is another example. Freezer burn doesn't look the same as regular ice cubes, right? Because what's happening in freezer burn is that there's humidity in the freezer that is going straight from a gas to a solid on your food. All right, and so the, this section is, is mostly about the vocab and understanding how these processes kind of work. Um, and But it also has to do with um, the energy, there's a laser pointer, um, of the different states. There are, you can have water in all three states simultaneously. You can have liquid water, gas water, and solid water all at the same time. And even if they're all at the same temperature, they're going to have different energies. The, at the same temperature, a gas molecule is going to have more energy than a liquid molecule. And a liquid molecule is going to have more energy than a solid molecule. So what that tells us is that there's going to, there's an energy difference associated with going back and forth between these different phases. Right. And so that's what that that um, homework question that had the uh, heat of condensation. Basically, there are three different energies associated with these phase changes. And whether they're, the energy is positive or negative just matters which direction you're headed. If you're going from a solid to a liquid versus a liquid to a solid, it's going to be the same amount of energy. It's just, do you have to put energy into it or is it being released? So to go from, a, from an ice cube to liquid water at the same temperature, you have to add energy into it. And that kind of makes sense everybody, right? It, you know, you think about it has to get warm for ice to melt. Um, it also means that the opposite is true though. That means when water freezes, it releases energy to the surroundings. So when water freezes, the surroundings actually get warmer, which seems counterintuitive. But if you've ever been on a, on a chairlift in rain, when it starts to turn to snow, you may have noticed it actually feels warmer because it, it is warmer. The temperature will go up a degree or two Fahrenheit when rain changes to snow. Because going from a liquid state to a solid state releases energy to the surroundings. It's what's called an exothermic process. Um, and so, again, the negative sign is frequently not written for these. For heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, heat of sublimation, they're usually not written as with a negative sign because you need to keep track of are you going from a gas to a solid or solid to a gas? And you have to think about, is that releasing energy to the surroundings or absorbing energy from the surroundings? Ron, can I just quickly show everyone my still? Sure. Talking about this stuff. I just brought it right here. This is my Alembic still. And it converts liquid to gas and then condenses it back to liquid again. I think it's just, it's, it's really sexy and it's fun to work with. But um, I can make alcohol from a fermented beverage like wine. Um, or I, what I typically do is extract um, plant essential oils and you put it in this part called the onion. So the water heats up, lifts steam as a vapor through plant material, collects the plant material and its essential oils, puts it through this, this tube. And then in this area, you have a cold water bath. 
So inside here, there's a little condensing tube, and then it turns back into liquid. I just wanted to show you guys that to give a visual. I appreciate that. That's that is that is really cool, um, and that that ties into this um, really well because you heat at the bottom when you want the water to evaporate and you have to cool it to get the water to condense because when the water condenses, it's warming up the surroundings. So you have to keep feeding cold water in to get it to condense the same way that you have to keep adding heat to the other side to get it to continue to evaporate. Exactly. Yeah, you have to fill this with ice or a, a com you know, a new stream of very cold water to condense it back again. So it's pretty fun. It is. Uh, it's stills are very, very interesting from the engineering point of view. Um, I, they're one of the first applications of chemical engineering back when chemical engineering was not even a field, was basically distillation um, was one of the first things that they really um, got their heads wrapped around and got the math all figured out for and optimized. Um, so this problem, this is a practice problem that is similar to the homework um, where we start with grams of ice. It says, how much energy does it take to convert all of the ice to water? Well, if you have a delta H of fusion, delta H of fusion is going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. Um, your drink gets colder when you put ice in it, right? Because you're dumping energy from your drink into the ice to melt it. So the ice needs to absorb energy to melt. So if we wanted to calculate how much energy it's going to take to do this, well, as long as our, our energies, these are our heat of fusion is in joules per gram, and this is for the right substance, all we have to do is say is cancel out the grams. So we'd wind up with uh, a a conversion that would look something like 15.0 grams and for every, um, so it's 334 joules over one gram. We'd wind up with the grams of the ice canceling out grams and we're going to be left in joules. Right, and so the, it doesn't even really matter what the process is. If you have one of these delta H values for any of these processes, you just have to make sure that your units cancel out. Um, and this, and if we want to know whether or not that's energy being absorbed or released, you have to think about what the process is. In this case, we're melting ice. We're going from low energy to a higher energy. So the ice needs to absorb that energy. So 334 times 15, you get 5,010. So to three sig figs, we'd get 5.01 times 10 to the three joules absorbed. And again, this is, this is where keeping those using those qualitative descriptors or um, as units can be really, really helpful. If you want to know whether energy is being absorbed or released, you have to think about the phase before and after. Um, second, if we, we could continue uh, to do another Q equation, if you had 150 grams of water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, what's the temperature after all the ice melts? Well, we have to take Fahrenheit and convert it into Celsius. Um, but then it's just a Q equation, right? We know the energy that's being absorbed from the ice, from the warm water. So Q would be negative 5.01 times 10 to the three. Let me, there we go. And the mass of the water that's changing temperature 
is 150 grams. And our specific heat of water is the same as it always is. So we could find delta T. Right, so this is this is very similar to the, the homework problems, right? Should look pretty familiar. We're finding an energy, and then we're using that energy to calculate delta T. Sean, can you tell me why you made it into negative for the heat? Yes, I can. So if there's five, if there's five thousand joules of energy are being absorbed by the ice. That's a that's a positive sign, a, um, a positive energy for the ice. The ice is gaining five thousand joules. Yes. And if the ice is gaining five thousand joules, where is that five thousand joules coming from? The water. So the water the water is then losing that same amount of energy, right? Yeah. So we would, when we plug it in down here, we would want to put a negative 5,000 for Q because we're switching our frame of reference. We went from talking about the, the water, the ice gaining energy to okay. the water losing that energy. Okay, so, and this applies to the second question then. This would be, this would be similar. Yeah, so we're talking about this for the second question, it would be negative 5,000. Okay. You, you, yeah. Um, so we would wind up with, if we plug these numbers in, we'd get negative 5.01 times 10 to the three joules um, times 150.0 grams times 4.184 joules gram degrees Celsius times delta T which I realize I wrote that a little small, so let me zoom in on it. Oh, sorry, I got on mute. Hi. Um, so, and the negative sign just came from have, from a switching perspective. We, we switched what system we're talking about. We were talking about the ice absorbing the energy, so it was positive. Now we're talking about the surroundings losing energy, so it's negative. And we would solve for delta T and we'd get an answer that's going to be by a little bit less than 10 degrees Celsius, if my math, math's right in my head. So 150 times 4.184 is about 600. 5,000 divided by 600 is going to be something a little bit less than uh, 10. So I get 7.98 degrees Celsius for my delta T. All right, so the, the bottom line, one, one of the tricks, I'm gonna say this again, I know I've already said it before, is anytime you have something changing temperature, so for the first part of this equation, we didn't have anything changing temperature, right? We had ice melting but no temperature change that we were talking about. If you're talking about temperature change, you're always gonna use your Q equation. Hang on, I used an absolute in there and I don't like that. Um, for this class, if we're talking about a temperature change, you're almost always gonna be using this Q equation. All right, so for the first part of this equation, or for the first part of this problem, we weren't using, didn't have anything changing temperature. And so that tells us we're not gonna be using Q up here. You need a temperature change for Q to matter or for, for that equation to be used. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, Joe. Wouldn't you, you didn't put 60 in there at all. Wouldn't you have oh. solved for the TF Instead yeah, I, I, I left the last piece of this alone because it said if it starts at 60 Fahrenheit, what's the final temperature? Um, so we would need to convert. So wouldn't 60. you do it factoring it like the 
other one where you you know you had to fact you had to uh, distribute into the TF and then solve for the. You don't need to for this one because you have all of the pieces to actually get your number for Q. So because you actually have a number for Q, you don't need to do that substitution. You can solve for if delta T is. That's a really bad delta. If you have delta T um, as, what did I come up with? 7.98 degrees Celsius. And that's gonna be a negative 7.98. Oh, you just plug it back into the 60 to get the. Yeah, once you convert that 60 Fahrenheit into Celsius, you can just do um, 7.98 equals T final minus whatever this 60 is in Celsius. So you can just okay. say it's, it's eight degrees lower than it was. Um, so you don't need to. A lot of times solving for delta T is easier than actually. Um, then plugging in TF minus T initial and solving for TF that way. A lot of times it's easier to just get delta T and then do um, find your final temperature. Okay. All right, so we will do another problem like this to practice at the beginning of class on Wednesday. I'm going to, I'm going to move on right now um, to get to a couple of other concepts in today's lecture and we'll keep practicing with this. Um, and the biggest concept that I want to talk about is um, this idea of phase change actually affects how temperatures change. I made a big deal out of if you have a temperature change, you always use Q equals mass times CP delta T. Um, with, we can make that assumption because if you go through a phase change, in general, the temperature will not change. While you're going through a phase change, so if I'm starting from ice um, and it's ice that's below zero Celsius and I start adding energy into it, at first, when I'm adding energy into it, and go to use the whiteboard here. So let's say I start at negative 15 Celsius, just picking a number. And on the bottom graph here, I'm going to make this Q. So the energy that we're adding in. So if I start down here at negative 15 Celsius, as I dump energy into the ice, first, it's just going to write, go up in a, in a straight line. Because as you add more Q, your, your temperature changes based on Q equals mass times CP delta T until you get to a phase change. When you get to zero Celsius, where water melts under normal conditions, or sorry, where ice melts under normal conditions, any new energy that you add in is going to change the phase. It's going to melting the ice, not going to changing the temperature. So as long as you go, are going through a phase change, your temperature is going to stay constant. Then as soon as your ice melts all the way and you have all liquid water at zero Celsius, it starts going up again until what temperature? It's going to be the next thing that's going to throw this off. Negative, negative 15. It's 100 degrees Celsius, right? Yeah, at, at atmospheric pressure, or at sea level, once you get to 100 Celsius, you start boiling the water. And once you start boiling the water, the temperature line flattens again. Because all the new energy you're dumping in is going to evaporating the water, not to raising the temperature. So this is why, why boiling water is such an important step in most, in a lot of recipes, is because it allows you to keep things at a constant temperature for an extended period of time. 
It's the reason why you don't need to get out a thermometer to see if um, to make dried pasta. You just need the water to boil and then you can cook it, right? If the temperature didn't stay constant while it was boiling, you would need a thermometer to double check what temperature you were sitting at in order to boil pasta. And so this is actually a, something that shows up all over the place. And this is exactly why um, things don't, baking does not work the same way at altitude. And even cooking rice and cooking um, dried pasta takes longer at altitude. Because at altitude, water boils at our altitude at lake level, it's about 92 Celsius, maybe 94 Celsius, depending on the day. And if we wind up with the water being held constant at 94 Celsius instead of 100 Celsius, it takes longer to cook things. Also means rice makers don't work as well at altitude. Um, because they're designed to keep temperature at a certain level. And if, and if you can't get up to 100 Celsius, your rice maker will just keep dumping energy in. That's why they always boil. If you have a, a rice maker up here at altitude, they boil over every time. It's because they're designed to keep things right around 100 Celsius. You can't adjust them, at least not the cheap one that I had, um, to keep it at 94 Celsius instead. All right, so this graph, this is called a heating curve, which is a little bit misleading considering it's all straight lines. Um, but when you, a, a heating curve is always just gonna be the temperature of the system on the y-axis and the energy in or the energy out on the x-axis. Right, so, and we'll look at the opposite case. If you were talking about removing energy instead of adding energy, we would have the exact opposite shape on this graph. You could have steam at 140 Celsius. And as you start pulling energy out, once you hit 100 Celsius, it condenses and the temperature line flattens out. And then once all of the steam is, is converted into water, liquid water, then the temperature will start dropping again until you hit freezing point and your temperature will level out again. All right, so um, one of the ways that, that you see questions written about this, um, about heating curves is in the context of um, if I describe a system and then you have the multiple choice, pick which of which heating curve that's shown matches. So you'd be looking at things like, okay, I'm starting at the right temperature and then temperature is going to go up until it hits a phase change and then it's going to flatten out. Um, and the other thing that's useful about these is that each one of these steps, each one of these lines in a heating curve is gonna have its own energy associated with it. It takes a certain amount of energy to go from steam at 140 to steam at 100. It's gonna take a different amount of energy to go from steam at 100 degrees Celsius to water at 100 degrees Celsius. Then if it keeps cooling down, it'll take a different amount of energy to go from water at 100 Celsius to water at zero Celsius. And then we hit another phase change. So each one of these steps that I have circled here, we can calculate the energy for any of these steps. For any of the ones where the temperature is changing, you're just gonna use your Q equation. You might need to look up the specific heat of steam or the specific heat of ice. For any of these flat phase changes, we're going to be able to use that heat of vaporization or heat of condensation. And you just like we did on the previous um, example, if the heat of what was the heat of um, fusion from the previous one was 334 joules per gram, if we want to find the amount of energy. If we want to find the amount of energy for any one of these steps, 
we found the amount of energy for this step right here, for the melting of ice based on the heat of fusion and how much ice we had. All right, so this allows us to ask big questions like this. Um, and actually this is just going from negative 20 degrees Celsius to zero Celsius for ice. That'd be the first step in warming this up. And then once it gets to zero Celsius, it starts melting and we can figure out that energy. So drawing your heating curve is a lot of times is a good way of figuring out what calculations you need to do. So let's, let's say that the entire process we wanted to talk about was going from ice at negative 23 Celsius to room temperature water. Drawing out the heating curve will help us with this because qualitatively we can say, okay, well, I don't know what the actual Q value is yet. But I know I'm starting at a certain temperature and I'm going to be adding Q, I'm adding heat. So if I'm starting at negative 23 Celsius. As I add energy, temperature will go up till I get to zero. Then it flattens out until all the ice melts. And then it's gonna go up again until I get to whatever it called for, 21 Celsius, I think. 20, 21 Celsius. Well, for each of these lines, we can calculate the energy. If we want to know the total energy, we would just add them all together. So to get the energy to um, the Q required to go from negative 23 to zero, that's change in temperature, right? So step one is going to require a certain amount of energy, and we can find that by using our Q equation. Step two is a phase change, which means we're going to need our delta H of fusion. We're going to need some energy, but then we can figure out based on how much ice we have what that energy is. And then to go, once we have all of our ice melted, we need a third energy to go from ice or from liquid water at zero Celsius to liquid water at room temperature. So if we want to know the total amount of energy to go from ice at negative 23 Celsius to water at 21 Celsius, we calculate these three steps and just add them together. Hey, Sean, I have a question. Yeah. So you would do two steps separate um, Q equations for that problem. Exactly. Okay. So I let me go back to the screen share because I have it broken up as these three steps. So the one I have labeled as step one on the board is going to use these numbers. Ice has its own specific heat um, and you're going to find your delta T is going to be going from negative 23 to zero. So you know delta T, you know specific heat of ice is given to you, and then you know the mass of the ice. So you can find Q for step one. For step two, we know we've got 23 grams of ice, and we know every one gram of ice melting takes 30, 334 joules have to be absorbed. So this would be for step two. And then last but not least, we, once we get through the phase change and our temperature starts changing again, well, anytime there's delta T, your first thought should be to use this equation. We have a different specific heat now. And our delta T is going to be different, but we can find Q as well. And so 
if you want to know your total energy, Q total, would just be Q from step one plus Q from step two, which is the one we calculated up here. Even though we didn't use that Q equation, we could still call it the heat because we had to add that energy in there, plus Q3. And again, we'll go through this, we'll practice with this on Wednesday. Um, but let's do a qualitative one real quick. So if we, if we have this situation, at Lake Tahoe's elevation, water boils around 94 Celsius. The sample of ice at zero Celsius is heated until it melts and then um, all the way until it becomes steam at 94 Celsius. Which of these four heating curves matches that description? All right, so think about the steps. If you're starting with ice at zero Celsius and going all the way to steam at 94 Celsius, Which of these options matches that? Assuming that this that this line, the solid line, is zero Celsius. It's not labeled explicitly. Thoughts? Throw it in the chat. It's an easy one. It's multiple choice. C? C makes the most sense, right? D is the complete heating curve. But if you look where we're starting, D is talking about a system where you're starting below zero Celsius and then it warms up to start melting. B and C are both starting at zero Celsius. A is starting at room temperature and then boiling water. So for A, you've got liquid water that gets heated up to boiling and then turns into steam where you continue heating the steam. So A, we can eliminate because we're not starting at zero Celsius. D goes through zero Celsius, but it starts below that. B starts at zero Celsius, then you melt the ice, and then temperature goes up until you get to 94 Celsius, and then temperature flattens out again, which is our melting or our boiling point. But then the temperature keeps going up. So this would be the equivalent. B would be if you took ice, melted it on the stove, let it come all the way up to boiling, and then boiled off all the water and continued to heat the, the steam. If we want it to become steam at 94 Celsius and stop there, C would be a better, a better descriptor. B would also include that, but we're going past that. So this, I guess, this is a little bit of an ambiguous question that way. Um, B or C, technically. Um, could work, although C is the better option because it shows the curve stopping at 94 Celsius and not continuing to get hotter after it all boils off. All right, so these heating curves have a lot of information built into them. Um, and they're they're useful for organizing your thoughts when you get a point blank question like, how much energy does it take to go from ice at negative 23 Celsius to steam at 150 Celsius? You, then you would draw something that looks like D here and label each of the individual steps and calculate all of your Qs for each step and just add them together to get your final answer. 
All right, so these heating curves are a good tool for organizing your, your thoughts for these problems. All right, and with that, I'm out of time. So we will start with this problem. Um, actually, we'll do the practice problem before that from back here. We'll, we will do a problem like this to warm up, and then we'll do a heating curve problem on Wednesday. Um, and we did not get to talking about atomic structures. So if you have lab today, come to lab. I'll give you a brief intro that'll get you started on the Labster um, simulation. And, uh, and then you'll get to hear it again, um, at least partially in, um, in lecture on Wednesday. All right, so I will see those of you with lab in a few minutes.